Colette, thank you very much. It's nice to be invited to your meeting, and uh, congratulations on, I gather this is the largest meeting you've had uh, in history. Your, your, your chairwoman deserves great credit for that, I'm sure. Uh, I was told to speak for 17 minutes. That reminded me of a uh, experience uh, shortly after I got to the Senate where Howard Baker, who was then the majority leader, was trying to get people to agree to conclude debate on a bill so we could vote, and uh, this was before filibusters were the normal practice. And there was no filibuster on this bill, and uh, we were we were just trying to get to a final vote, and, and so Howard Baker said, uh, I asked unanimous consent that all senators be limited to 30 minutes of, of speaking time on this uh, bill. And uh, Russell Long from Louisiana uh, said, I object. And so Howard uh, paused a minute and he said, uh, well, I asked unanimous consent that, that all senators be limited to 45 minutes. And Russell Long said, I object. And, uh, and he said, I ask unanimous consent that each senator be limited to an hour. And Russell Long said, I object. And then Howard uh, Baker said to Russell Long, can the senator advise how long he anticipates speaking on this bill? And, and Senator Long said, uh, you know, I never know how long I'm going to speak until I get started. <laughs> and at any rate, that... Uh, seemed relevant to the 17-minute limit. Uh, the report I'm talking about today is uh, a report that was done at Stanford University that I was a part of, and uh, it's called the State Clean Energy Cookbook, A Dozen Recipes for State Action on Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, the report was prepared by two organizations, the Steyer Taylor Center at the Stanford Law School. Dan Riker, who's going to be on the panel here uh, in just a moment, uh, is the director of that center. And I worked with him on, on, on the work there. Uh, the other organization at Stanford is the uh, Schultz Stevenson Task Force on Energy Policy at the Hoover Institute. And of course, our former Secretary of State, George Schultz, uh, heads up that organization, and Jeremy Carl uh, works with him, as does David Fetter there. This is a consensus document of those two organizations. There was a genuine collaboration uh, between the two organizations, and we called on experts. Uh, Diane Greenwich is here. I know she's on the program uh, uh, during your, your conference. Uh, she uh, was a big help to us. Many others were. We, we had several... Uh, state commissioners uh, who came to a conference we had a year ago last October uh, where we tried to understand these issues better. The report was prompted by a desire to focus on energy efficiency and renewable energy policies at the state level, uh, frankly because uh, very little is possible at the national level uh, on many of these issues today. Also, there was a concern that uh, there seemed to be a concerted effort to repeal or, or weaken many of the policies that seemed to be uh, in place. Uh, and we wanted to identify policies that had succeeded in particular states and then do what we could to highlight those and hope that they would be considered by other states for implementation around the country. The EPA's proposed uh, rule on setting carbon emission standards was also a, a consideration. Uh, obviously, it calls on states to come up with plans to meet those new standards, and we thought that this might be a useful inventory of policies, uh, some of which uh, might be helpful in meeting those standards. So the purpose of the report is to highlight effective, innovative policies uh, and, and I should emphasize that uh, we, were, we were focused here on the electric power generation sector. Uh, the report does not consider transportation uh, sector issues or, or policies in the transportation sector. The report does not include policies which 
are generally considered to be putting a price on carbon. We did not propose that states uh, consider cap and trade proposals or carbon, carbon taxes or increased fuel taxes of any kind. Uh, we, we felt that those were per perhaps not as achievable. And therefore, uh, we would concentrate on, on some policies that have been implemented and been shown to work and that uh, might be implementable elsewhere. The template that we followed in each case, we have the 12 policies. Uh, and then uh, the template we followed in each case was to, to look at six different things, to, to describe the policy, first of all. That would be the first category to talk about states where we thought the policy had been implemented uh, to good, good result. Uh, third, to make a recommendation with regard to the policy. Fourth, to point out the policy benefits. Fifth, to, to discuss the design considerations. There's tremendous variety in many of these policies from state to state. I'm sure you're all aware of that. And, and so we tried to identify some of those differences and put them in a, a, a category we called design considerations. And then we tried to identify some additional resources which a person could go to if you were interested in following up on any of these particular policies. Now we chose policies in three areas. Energy efficiency, we chose four policies there. We chose policies on, on promoting renewable energy, four policies there, and then we chose four policies designed to assist with the financing of either energy efficiency improvements or uh, more use of renewable energy. And then we concluded with a recommendation to, to the Congress and to the administration in Washington uh, to increase support for the Department of Energy's state energy program, which seemed to us to be a successful program where it has been used, and we encourage uh, more, effort, uh, be more effort and resources both be put into that program. So let me uh, start through these uh, policies very briefly. Uh, energy efficiency. The first policy we identified there was energy efficiency resource standards. Uh, those have, of course, been adopted in many states. I think a majority of states now have that in place. Uh, uh, we, we believe that energy efficiency resource standards have, have been successful in promoting efficiency and cutting energy bills for consumers. And we uh, particularly point to what Wisconsin did in 20. 11 with the law that they passed in that year and uh, urge states to consider that. Uh, any state that has not implemented a energy efficiency resource standard, look at what uh, has happened particularly in that state. The second of the policies related to energy efficiency that we identified were, were, were the traditional uh, energy efficient building codes. Uh, for new buildings. That's, that's fairly obvious, uh, but uh, we think that a lot of success can be achieved in improving energy efficiency by re revisiting those codes. Uh, we point to what Mississippi has done recently as an example of what we consider a success in that area, and uh, we, we think that uh, states ought to consider doing the same. Uh, third, uh, building energy benchmarking and disclosure. The issue here, of course, is uh, uh, disclosing energy performance information for large, both commercial and residential buildings. Uh, this is something that started, uh, is starting, and California has adopted policies with regard to this. Washington State has, uh, and quite a few of our major cities around the country have adopted policies on this. We think this is a step forward, and we encourage others to look at it as well. Uh, and the fourth policy is, uh, is a very large, it's not a single policy, frankly, it's a category of policies, but we lump together uh, utility and customer market incentives. Basically, the point here is one that you're all familiar with, which is that the traditional utility model, the cost of service revenue model, does not provide substantial incentive 
uh, to utilities to promote efficiency, and we believe that uh, many states have begun looking at, uh, at how that can be modified. Washington State is, is a place where they have gone through a long process of trying to figure out uh, a version of decoupling that will provide more incentive to the utility uh, to uh, uh, promote efficiency, and uh, we believe that is a su successful effort that other states should be aware of and look at. On the consumer side, again, uh, we think consumers, uh, customers, have inadequate uh, incentives to reduce power uh, consumption uh, at periods of peak demand. And uh, we, we point to what Arizona has done there uh, over a long period of time. They have had policies in place, uh, time of use electricity pricing policies, which again, provide an incentive on the consumer and the, and the customer side to, uh, uh, to be more efficient in the use of energy. So that's the, uh, those are the four related to energy efficiency. Next, uh, related to renewable energy, uh, we started with the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which is probably the best known of the state policies uh, related to renewable energy. And uh, we particularly draw attention to what North Carolina has done. North Carolina has adopted a renewable portfolio standard. They're the first state in the southeast part of the country to do that. But uh, we, we think that uh, some of what they've done uh, uh, can, can be instructive to other states that might consider doing something in this area. I think the renewable portfolio standard has probably been the most effective standard at the state level for encouraging more deployment of renewable power uh, generation uh, capability. Uh, after that, we looked at net energy metering. Most states have some form of net energy metering uh, in place. Uh, this, of course, relates to distributed generation, and we think uh, it is an important uh, support uh, to uh, promote more distributed generation, which we think is a good thing. Uh, we draw attention to what Austin, Texas has done with their value of solar tariff. And, uh, and, and say that that is something that everyone ought to be aware of. I don't know if that's the solution in most states, but it's certainly something that is innovative. And uh, we also point to Vermont's recent experience in updating uh, their net energy metering laws or regulations. Uh, we think that, uh, that that was a useful exercise. Obviously, the refining of, of uh, these net energy metering provisions is something which is very much uh, uh, going on in almost every state in the union today. The third item uh, under renewable energy, that uh, third policy, is uh, community renewables. So we were impressed with what Colorado has done, particularly with their, uh, uh, with their solar community solar gardens law that they enacted. Uh, and uh, California, of course, has now enacted a... Uh, a, uh, a, a law that is, contemplates a substantially larger installation of community solar uh, uh, capability in the state. Uh, we think that this idea of enabling multiple customers to share in the economies of scale so that we don't just have everyone putting solar panels on his or her roof uh, is, a, is a good uh, direction to go in. Uh, and, uh, and we encourage states to look at that uh, uh, as, a, as an option. Now, that, that requires uh, changes in statute, I believe, in, in virtually any state that wants to do it, but uh, it has worked well in Colorado, and, in, and we, uh, although the, the program's really not been implemented here in California, the expectation is that it will work uh, here as well. Uh, renewable energy tariffs, uh, this is something, again, we, we believe that it makes sense for states to permit contracting between utilities and large commercial and industrial energy consumers uh, when those uh, large consumers wish to procure renewable, additional renewable power uh, that uh, they will pay for. Uh, we point to what 
has happened in Virginia and in North Carolina, both as examples of, of what we're talking about here, and we, we can't see a, uh, a justification for other states not doing the same thing. It seems to us to make sense if you designed it in such a way that, uh, uh, that the generation, uh, the new generation is not being subsidized by the general uh, consumer. Uh, the final uh, category of, uh, that we dealt with is the financing of these projects. Uh, the, the first item there is energy saving performance contracts. Uh, this is again a law that is in place on the books in virtually every state in the union. Uh, our impression is that in some states it has worked and worked reasonably well. In other states it is not working. Uh, and is not being implemented uh, to near the extent that it could be. We point to Pennsylvania's uh, success. Uh, frankly, when Governor Rendell was, was there, he made this a priority. His administration did. Uh, there was substantial uh, effort uh, that went on here, and it resulted in, in all, both in uh, increased energy efficiency, but also in quite a bit of job creation. Uh, we think uh, as I say, in many states, my own included, it has not worked uh, near as well. There has not been a single agency that is, has the job of being the champion, and, 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 and where there has been a single agency with that job, it has not been adequately resourced uh, to actually uh, get out and promote more use of energy-saving performance contracts. The, uh, the next item here is third-party ownership of distributed power systems. Uh, in, in my home state of New Mexico, uh, we, we passed a law a few years ago that uh, makes it clear that, uh, uh, that uh, this sort of uh, third-party ownership is permitted, that, uh, uh, that these, these third-party owners are, are not to be regulated as utilities. Uh, that, that's essential, obviously, if you're going to have uh, many of the uh, third party, uh, the companies that are in, engaged in this kind of activity uh, come into the state and, uh, and make a success of their effort. Uh, the third item here is property assessed clean energy. I think we're all aware that these PACE programs have not been able to go forward at the with regard to residential property, uh, primarily because of the Federal Housing Finance Agency's uh, uh, determinations that uh, these, these uh, uh, were contrary to uh, provisions in the security agreement that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae uh, uh, have in place uh, in, in, uh, with regard to many mortgages. But uh, we think that PACE programs focused on the commercial sector uh, make a lot of sense. And uh, we, we point to what Connecticut has done there and uh, urge other states to try to follow the lead of Connecticut in, uh, in doing that. Now, the final item under financing is on-bill repayment. And here uh, we think this is another option uh, which uh, can be made available to consumers uh, so that they can get uh, cost-effective uh, energy efficiency and distributed power uh, installations uh, put in place and essentially have those pay repaid through the owner's utility bill. Uh, th this is where the upgrade or the installation is, is not done by the utility itself, but the provision can be made uh, for the uh, utility bill that attaches to that uh, facility or that, that, uh, that building to, to cover the cost and to repay the, the cost of the installation. Hawaii has done something significant in this area, New York State as well, and we think both of those are examples that people ought to be aware of and look at. As I say, the 13th item, the uh, is federal support of state action uh, there. The state energy program uh, run by the Department of Energy, we think, has been a great success in, in helping those states that have taken advantage of this, and we encourage uh, more effort at the federal level to make that available uh, to more states. 
the target audience for our report is uh, people like yourselves, uh, people who are making policy on energy efficiency and renewables in, in each of our states, uh, governors uh, obviously as well, legislators at the state level as well. Uh, we, we believe that if states are looking to update and to, uh, to have more uh, use of renewable energy in their states, uh, it makes sense to consider to go back and revisit some of these policies, uh, many of which are already in place in each of our states. So that's our report. Uh, we hope it's a useful document for, for you and your deliberations. And uh, I'll stop with that, and we can do the panel. But thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that overview as much as I did, and I hope that you take time to review the cookbook. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists who will join the senator and give us their views as well. In the interest of time, we'll forego bios, and but you've uh, reviewed them, I'm certain. NARUT Committee on Electricity Chair David Boyd of Minnesota, please join us on the stage. NARUT Committee on Energy Resources and the Environment Chair Robert Kenney of Missouri. Acting Vice President of State Affairs at Solar Energy Industries Association, Sarah Birmingham. Vice President of Policy Development at the Nuclear Energy Institute, Richard Myers. Dan Riker, and you've heard the Senator reference Dan and his great work. Executive Director at the Styler Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance at Stanford University. And Dan is also former Assistant Secretary and Chief of Staff at the U.S. Department of Energy. Please help me welcome all of our guests. Now, I have a, the senator is so gracious. He's going to give me his microphone. I think it's more important that you keep it, Senator. I think I also want to mention to all of you as we begin this discussion, we won't have any PowerPoints at this juncture, no dissertations. We want a really fast-paced dialogue, and we really want you to stay engaged, and I hope you'll think about any questions you might ask our panelists a little later in this discussion. So for starters, I want to begin uh, by asking any, any of our panelists this morning, and I want to thank you for being here. This really is a great, great session we're about to embark upon. I want to ask you to give us your thoughts about the senators and the team's work on this cookbook. And we'll start with you, David. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the cookbook is great. And, and for those of us in, in states where we tend to drill down on our own specific situations, our own laws, our own economic policies, energy policies, it's, it's nice to be able to go to a buffet, if you will, stay on the food theme. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, see what options are out there for improving the state of affairs. Uh, Minnesota has a, a, a many of these uh, pieces of, of uh, policy in place, starting with a 2007 major revision to energy law and, and further refinements. We have an aggressive renewable portfolio standard, now augmented with an addition for a solar standard. Uh, we have an aggressive energy efficiency standard. And the good news is that through uh, well-crafted legislation, very thorough and thoughtful interaction between stakeholders and legislators, you come up with policy that's working. <laughs> and our utilities are on pace or ahead of pace on, on all of these pieces. Uh, the energy efficiency has been, I think, uh, one surprise, one pleasant surprise that uh, a utility is, is ahead of the curve by a substantial amount. We have utilities ahead of their goals on renewable portfolio standard. That doesn't mean we aren't done. So it's nice to have a single resource that we can go to to look to improve uh, the state of affairs. Something simple that legislators can read and understand mm -hmm. uh, is always nice. And from, from a physics professor. Yeah, from you, no, it's a physics professor. <laughs> we, we try to teach him science, but... <laughs> It's a barking dog problem, I think. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a very wonderful resource, a great report, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that it came out. It will be very helpful. It, it's very much in the spirit of NARUC, where we try to offer educational opportunities to our members to see how we can improve the situation of our, our members. Indeed. Thank you. Well said. Chairman Kinney. Good morning. Thank you. And um, as I read, the, I read the report and was 
want to thank Stanford and the Hoover Institution and Senator Bingaman and, and uh, Secretary Schultz and the authors for doing it because it's very constructive, it's very particular and specific and offers a lot of really good solutions. But as I was reading it, I was reminded that nature abhors a vacuum and that in, when there's an empty space, something's going to fill it. And that's what the states have really done. We talk a lot about the absence of federal energy policy and there's a great vacuum there. And the states have been uh, filling that void. And the report really, really responds to that. 38 states have RPS standards, 28 states have energy efficiency standards or, or goals. And what I really was struck by with the clean, with the clean energy handbook is that it points out um, not just the regulatory reforms that are going to help consumers and utilities, but it also talks about market-based policies that can help, such as energy performance stand, uh, savings contracts and, and on-bill financing. So. It's, it's really a constructive handbook that is going to be beneficial to us as regulators, and I think as, as David pointed out, it'll be very beneficial to hand off to state legislators and help to educate them as well. So that, those were my initial thoughts. Um, and I was also struck by the fact that the way it's structured really uh, points us in the direction of how we need to be holistic in examining, examining problems, not just looking at what we can do as regulators in our own spheres, but how we need to educate members of our General Assembly, how we need to work constructively and collectively with with banks and members of the financial sector. So it really uh, is going to, I think, be uh, beneficial and stimulating thought, stimulating ideas and stimulating solutions and helping us work collectively with all the stakeholders that, that are really interested in facilitating and promoting policies that are going to lead to the deployment of more renewable energy and more energy efficiency. Indeed. I, too, thought there's something in there for everyone. And please give us Sia's perspective, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to say uh, thank you to the senator and the, and the team at Stanford. I think that the report is excellent and brings a lot of great recommendations. Uh, when I was reading it, I was really struck at uh, how much in common uh, we, the planning that we have at SEA, at the Solar Energy Industries Association, has with the report. Uh, when we've been thinking about our 2015 priorities, we really classified them into three groups, uh, to improve financing, to expand markets, and grid integration. And this report really covers the, the first two very well. And in particular, when we're looking at expanding markets, um, I think that the recommendations within the renewable energy section are uh, very striking and, and helpful because they really cover the range of customers that we see. There's really something for everybody. There's the behind the meter solar uh, customer for net metering. There's the large utility scale projects with the uh, renewable portfolio standards. But what's also new are customers that are interested in solar and renewable energy, but may not be able to host on their particular facility. So I uh, really appreciate the recommendations on community solar. And I uh, agree with the Senator that you know, we can just look to the state of Colorado for some of the excellent work that they've done out there with their solar gardens program. But I also think that the renewable energy tariff is uh, a, a new mechanism that has a lot of promise. I just heard this morning from Google who was talking about the many different data centers that they have around the country. And they're going to their local utility and saying, we want renewable energy. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they really are indicative of this new uh, class of customers that have incredibly large loads and want to be served by renewable energy, but don't necessarily have the space to host that size of a system on site. And this is really a remarkable change from the large commercial industrial industrial users we've seen in the past that really went to the utility and said, we want low-cost low energy and we want reliable energy. This is a new class of customer, and I think that this is a new tool that we should really develop to help meet those needs. Thank you, Sarah. Richard. Thank you, President Honorable. Um, I, I did read the report. I, I found it enormously interesting. I think that um, there's huge potential for clean energy deployment in this country. Yeah, I, I'm concerned that there might be one missing ingredient in this cookbook. Um, and since we're on the subject of, of state leadership, 
Um, I feel obliged to acknowledge what's going on in the states of Georgia and South Carolina, um, thanks to both supportive legislation and very constructive regulatory policy. Uh, we have four nuclear reactors under construction in those two states. Um, these are put together in total a $25 billion plus initiative. Um, there are at this moment 10,000 people employed building those plants. Uh, that direct employment, the indirect employment is probably 1.2 to 1.5 times that. Um, these plants are going to be producing carbon-free electricity until the late 2070s. Um, and I certainly plan to be around to, uh, to see that. Um, <laughs> Uh, when they're operating, they will, each of these projects will represent 800 to 1,000 high-paying jobs. Um, and when they're running, assuming they run at the same level as the, as the current fleet, uh, these four reactors will produce 32 billion kilowatt hours of carbon-free electricity a year, which is, give or take, roughly 20% of last year's entire wind output. So if you want clean energy, we can give you clean energy. <laughs> um, but apart from that, I thought it was an outstanding piece of work. And um, uh, as I say, just, just one missing ingredient. <laughs> Richard, thank you. When you said there's one missing ingredient, I thought, what would he say next? I wasn't sure. Well, before we go on, let me pause and ask both Senator Bingaman and Dan to just tell us as you uh, prepared this work, as you went about your work to develop this cookbook and this report, what surprised your team the most, would you say? Well, I, I guess I was uh, somewhat surprised at the uh, extent of the activity that had taken place at the state level. There are lots of uh, policies that have been in place for a long time uh, in various states that uh, we think are are certainly in the right direction, um, but uh, you know there, there's such a variety and such a variation in these policies that uh, it seemed to me, you know, one of the one of the touchstones for this report was Brandeis's uh, 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 great talk about uh, the the states being the laboratories of democracy. Indeed. And I think he had in mind not only that the federal that the national government would learn from the states, but that states could learn from each other. I don't know the extent to which states are learning from each other uh, as much as they could be. So that, that's one, one perspective. Point well taken, Senator. And quite frankly, our NARIC meetings are the perfect opportunity for energy regulators, industry, stakeholders alike, consumer advocates, uh, renewables, and nuclear, Richard. Uh, experts to come and learn from one another. So I appreciate that point very much. Dan. Well, let me first thank Senator Bingaman. It was remarkable to be able to work with him, former chairman of the Senate Energy Committee, and, and I will have to say working with former secretary of not only state but Treasury, Labor, and OMB, uh, George Schultz, who at the age of 93 is going strong. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, it's quite something to be able to sit at a table with a guy who actually worked with President Nixon, President Ford, President Carter, President Reagan, and on and on. And he's got one, not only wonderful stories to tell, but a real perspective. And what we really benefited from is a moderate Democrat sitting down with a moderate Republican two very different institutions at Stanford and saying, you know, there got to be some things we can agree on in terms of what the states are up to. And our criteria were for that these policies were already on the books. We were not going out to invent new things. Um, that they were had been adopted in both blue and red states. Again, looking for bipartisan agreement. That they had good support and there were good prospects of cost effectiveness. Uh, so when we, we really looked for those criteria and almost to a policy measure, we, we found them. And we said, and this was probably the most colorful quote in the report, and it certainly was the one that the press picked up on, we said, put simply, both red states and blue states are turning green, whether measured in dollar savings or environmental benefit. And, and I was really struck 
as the senator said, by the range of states that have stepped up, um, including states that would be termed more conservative states, to look at Arizona, Mississippi, North Carolina, Virginia, and the steps <laughs> they've taken in this area of efficiency renewables and new forms of finance. So it was a, it was a very heartening kind of a process. And, um, and Richard, I will say, um, we'd love to, we'd love to do cookbook number two and talk about the nuclear industry because there is a lot to talk about there and there are real, some real success stories coming down the line. Well, I hear something brewing here, don't you? Talking about brewing is right. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, the the, well, the the puns in this project were quite overwhelming at times. <laughs> well, too, I want to just. Uh, put a pin in something you've just mentioned, the richness of the fact that you aren't proposing new legislation or either at the state level or the federal level. These are things already on the books in states across the country, and it really presents an incredible opportunity. Um, Richard, did you have your finger up to say something? No? Uh, yeah, I did want to say that uh, although I really do believe the states, because they're closer to their markets, are... Um, uh, as the senator said, the incubator um, of, of many, many good ideas. At so, some point, I do think there is a role for the federal government in energy policy. Um, and we can talk about that if you care to. It's, uh, uh, Dan mentioned moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans, and not to, no reference to your age, Senator, but you really are one of a dying breed. Um, Based, based on the performance we're seeing in Washington at the moment, which is really unfortunate because I think this country does have some very, very serious long-term energy and environmental issues that have to be addressed. I think the states have a key role to play in that, but there is a role for the federal government that so far the federal government is abdicating. That's a perfect bridge to my next question for each of you, and I'd certainly like to yield first to the senator. Uh, we are all thinking about the results of the midterm elections. We've been talking about it here quite a bit. And I want to ask you, each of you, if you have any thoughts, uh, no pressure here, of course, but if you have any thoughts about whether Congress will be able to take up any energy uh, legislation uh, after the results of the midterm election. Senator. Well, my own, uh, just, just reading the newspapers, uh, it I doesn't seem to me very likely that they would be able to do anything in a lame duck session. Nothing, course, Senator, nothing? Uh, I, I, I spoke to... I spoke to a good friend uh, there in Washington a, a couple of days ago, and I said, what's the chance of getting a tax extender package done in the lame duck session? And he said, we're hoping that they are able to agree to keep the lights on. That's that's the extent <laughs> of our expectations at this point. And, uh, uh, anything beyond that is uh, w would be icing on the cake. So um, I do think in the new Congress there there ought to be an ability to move ahead. Uh, the Shaheen Portman bill that came out of the Senate uh, is a modest piece of energy efficiency legislation that has good bipartisan support. Uh, the reason it could not move ahead was the threat of all kinds of amendments being offered to it, which uh, uh, were objectionable to various uh, various people. But uh, if there's if there is an ability of the the new majority leader, Senator McConnell and uh, Senator Reid, the minority leader now, to work together on on what bills come to the floor, I would hope. Shaheen Portman is one of those bills, and I hope they can pass it through the next Congress early on. Indeed, thank you. And the senator was aware of my inside joke there. Any other thoughts on this? I think Richard was not bashful. He's already shared his. Uh, sure. If from the Solar Energy Industry Association perspective, um, obviously we have a big cliff coming up with the investment tax credit that's expiring at the end of 2016. And so while we realize that Congress is uh, not 
likely to be championing a clean energy discussion, we are hopeful that we can be part of the energy discussion as they move forward. And I think that why this is really important to all of you as regulators and um, for the utilities out there is this is really going to help the price economics for uh, EPA regulation compliance. And so it, it really is important to all of us, even though it is a federal issue. And uh, for the solar industry, one of our uh, top priorities is um, first ensuring that there is commenced construction language added to that legislation so that uh, projects that start in or, or start, start construction but aren't necessarily completed by the end of 2016 are able to get that tax credit. And then, of course, we can talk about extension at that point. This is a place I shouldn't go. Um, because Let's I, never stop you before, David. Know that. Um, I, let's just say there's plenty of good opportunity for legislation, things that, that you would hope would be agreeable to both parties, both chambers. Um, history suggests that's not terribly likely, but I know every time we take a trip, our friends across the world start asking us about LNG, for example. Indeed. And whether there are ways to accelerate um, uh, our, our LNG capabilities. Uh, my worry, just cynically, is that we've come out of an election, we are in the midst of the next, the 2016 cycle, so you could imagine the Republican majority is going one of two ways, correct me here, either show that they can lead now that they have both chambers and try to demonstrate their ability to be productive, or dig in and get ready for the next set of elections in a presidential cycle, in which case gridlock persists. So I, I don't know what to say. I'm a bit of a cynic, I guess. Not much of a political scientist, though. <laughs> Dan, did you have any thoughts? Uh, just a couple quick things. One thing that obviously has to happen is that agencies do have to get their appropriations. How that happens, whether there are individual appropriations for each agency or somehow we wind our way to a, a budget, um, there's big money that changes hands. The Department of Energy will get funded one way or the other, and there are very significant programs there in nuclear, fossil, efficiency, renewables, and those have been driving forces in, in a lot of what's going on on today. Uh, so I think that will remain, there will be some movement there and there are some opportunities. The state energy program is a DOE program. It has done some good work. I think there are opportunities to increase the, the budget there. That's minor. The other thing I do think is that this could be, and the senator and I were talking about this a little bit at, at breakfast, this could be a Congress that somehow works its way to tax reform. Um, I think there may be enough that both sides, all sides, need in this in this situation as far as reform of our tax code that we we might strike a deal there in the in the next couple of years and 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 in all of that is obviously a lot related to tax from uh, the the tax credits involving renewables. There's a lot of discussion of of oil and gas related taxation. There's carbon capture and sequestration. There's a whole set of things there that. In an even broader context of tax reform, there may be able to be a, a deal cut. We've been we've been pressing something called master limited partnerships, expanding those for renewables, um, and that's gotten good bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House. And we think that there's a vehicle to attach that bill to it. It could get adopted. Well, indeed, and I'm glad that you referenced funding. You need the money. And, and whether it's through a true budget or through continu continuing resolutions. Thank you. Richard, did you have something to offer here? This is no secret to anybody in this room. The interesting thing about the power business is the latency is so long. You know, we, um, the world we're living in today is a product of decisions that were made 15 and policies that were put in place 15 years ago renewable portfolio standards and restructuring and, and you know, we pay the price for our decisions many years out and, and it concerns me because as I look out to 15 years from now, um, I see 100 gigawatts of nuclear capacity coming up on 60 years of, of operation. Now some of it will be relicensed and go beyond 60 years, but some of it may not depending on the capital investment required and the regulatory requirements and market conditions. I, I look at the coal fleet, and I know coal is a bit out of favor at the moment, but it was 40% of our electricity supply last year. Mm -hmm. We're going to shut down probably a third of it 
by the early 2020s. By 2030, less than 10% of today's coal fleet is going to be under 35 years old. There's no new coal to speak of in the pipeline. So I, as I look forward, I, I begin to, to be concerned about the, the, the amount of generating capacity that's going to be need, need to be replaced and the amount of new capacity that's going to have to get built. Um, renewables, nuclear, and others, uh, and, and, and I worry about the financing. I don't think the states can carry all of this financing on their own. I think there is a role for the federal government to provide financing support. Um, and, and so I think there are some longer term issues that unless we deal with them, um, you know, the decisions we make this year, next year, the year after are going to determine what kind of world we're living in in 2030. So if we really want to control our own destiny, we need to get on with it. Very well said, and what a comprehensive uh, set of viewpoints about where we may or may not be headed, whether you're hopeful or you're like David Boyd and you're cynical. That's something new. I didn't know you were cynical. <laughs> All right, let's turn to something Sarah Birmingham just referenced about solar policies. And certainly at the state level, we've noticed quite a bit of prominence in a couple of states over the last couple of years with regard to solar issues, one being Arizona, of course, and the other being Georgia, I think was a delightful surprise. How do you see the public's attention shaping this work, particularly with regard to renewables? Uh, and in light of some new and interesting leaders uh, in the forefront. Anyone? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I think the, the public, to a large degree, is driving a lot of our policies because customer expectations are increasing with respect to wanting more and better information, wanting renewable portfolio standards, and wanting renewable energy. Commercial uh, customers are driving that discussion significantly as well. You've got Walmart demanding more renewable energy. And so I think that the public's attention is definitely growing as a result of their own expectations, as a result of climate expect or climate change issues, as a result of greater deployment of DG. And I think that's only going to continue. Mm -hmm. um, I know in, in Missouri we've had, we have a net metering standard or net metering statute and we compensate the excess generation at an avoided cost rate, not a, f a, a full retail rate. But we're having those discussions at the state level largely driven by uh, consumers and largely driven by utilities. I think that's only going to continue to increase. Indeed. I often say this isn't our grandparents' utility anymore, where we tell consumers what they should embrace. They're telling us, and I think it's a beautiful thing. And, and like you in Missouri and Arkansas, we've undertaken a rewrite of our net metering rules, our meter aggregation rules. And, Senator, you'll be pleased to know that Arkansas was the most improved state, according to ACEEE, with regard to energy efficiency. <laughs> Any other thoughts, David? Uh, Robert's exactly right. Public interest is, is exceedingly high in driving the policy change at the state level. We have a, my poor colleagues out in the audience, we've been dealing with numerous dockets on value of solar tariff, solar garden implementation, third party ownership issues, trying to work through the litany of issues to make this work out. The, the public's interest is partly financial, partly independence, partly clean energy driven. And I think to your point about Georgia, it just shows that leaders make a big difference. The, Indeed. The commissioners in Georgia, as elected commissioners in Arizona, have more autonomy to act than, than in Minnesota, for example. And they've been very responsive to what they've heard, and they've, they've helped drive, a, a, create a new industry, a new chapter in, in the state. I, I do think we need to be careful to manage expectations. We have an obligation to, to educate particularly some residential folks, to, to have some protections in place for um, installers who might be of lower quality or have ill intent. Uh, but on the whole, this is the direction, and, it, and it's completely changed the direction of the electric industry. It's not your father's electric utility anymore. Well, too, I should mention here, David, we've certainly watched you all in Minnesota um, as we have uh, the city of Austin with regard to the value of solar tariff, much like the solar experiences in Arizona and Georgia, uh, there's so much for us to learn from one another. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I'd just quickly say that solar, pun intended, I guess, shines a light on a lot of other 
a lot of other issues solar in a distributed capacity there's the whole world of smart grid solar in a utility capacity there's this looming issue of citing large scale transmission particularly in the west we're struggling with that solar and storage how quickly is storage going to come on cost effectively and solar and natural gas there's a there's a great opportunity for inner integration of those uh, to deal with the intermittency of solar and wind and these fast ramping turbines so there's a whole set of things that I think spin importantly out from this discussion of, of renewables and, and the public's push, which is largely focused on solar as solar, but as that get in, gets implemented, it raises all of these other challenges and opportunities that I think are pretty significant. Indeed. And I mentioned to the Senator before we began that when our team at Nehru presented me with this cookbook, I told him it was as if the heavens parted and this cookbook fell down uh, to us. Uh, quite frankly, because it gives us an opportunity to, to talk more in depth uh, at one of our general sessions about clean energy, about energy efficiency, and about uh, demand response, for instance. Also, though, it gives us an opportunity to highlight uh, the diversity of the states and the ways that states are working creatively to make this work. And again, one of the most beautiful things is we have all the ingredients. Uh, they're in our pantries, they're in our cupboards. So I want to ask Chairman Boyd and Kenny your thoughts about how you think states uh, might embrace or what you think they might take away from this report. So, you know, I think state regulators, what, I, what I'm taking away from it is that we're going to continue to be the prime movers in helping to facilitate innovation and pu good public policy around the deployment of energy efficiency and renewable energy. I know, I think Richard's right, there is a role for the federal government to play. And I get concerned, not as a state regulator, but just as a citizen of the United States, about the lack of certainty. I know that capital markets appreciate some measure of certainty, and so that is a significant role that I think the federal government can play in ensuring certainty. But in the absence of that, state regulators are going to continue doing what we do, and that's you know thinking creatively and addressing these issues. We are closer to the citizens. We know what our customers want because we're hearing it, and we're hearing what our what our ratepayers want. Um, so I think we're going to continue to do that. I think the other takeaway from this is that. Um, the regulatory community is increasingly recognizing the need to work collaborative, collaboratively with a broad range of relevant stakeholders in pursuing good public policy formulation and implementation. I think one of the one of the prime examples of that is the the Critical Consumer Issues Forum, where we bring together consumer advocates, public utility regulators, and the utilities themselves to have these discussions about how to properly implement these public policies that are going to do justice to both consumers and to the utilities. So that's that's really, the, from my perspective, the real value in this report is that you've got states from across the political and ideological spectrum that have, in the absence of federal policy, found a way to advance good public policies that are, that are benefiting both utilities and uh, consumers. And I think that's going to continue to be the case. That's a great answer. I, I, the only thing I'd add is that I, I think that as we watch uh, these, these new technologies evolve, and we do see what happens in other states, and we really appreciate states like California that take the lead on something like a, sto a, a storage mandate, because I agree, storage is just an absolutely critical piece of this puzzle, storage in all of its various forms, uh, that as we uh, exercise our mandate to balance the, the needs of the utilities to be viable and the citizens uh, to be uh, ratepayers who receive proper value and proper service, that balance is changing, that equation is shifting, and, and we need to engage in different kinds of conversations of the sort Robert mentioned that include all of the stakeholders in order to get to the right place. The utility business model change that we've been talking about for a long time is woven into this, and new players and new entrants with new expectations, these are all things that we're now trying to juggle mm -hmm. uh, as, as we advance uh, uh, state energy policy, and, uh, and states will continue to be active and evolve with or without a, a layer of federal um, intervention or oversight or cooperation. That's true, and quite frankly, we really wouldn't have a choice, would we? <laughs> it's coming our way. Let me pause now. Uh, I'm sure something here this morning has, has given you a thought or two. I wanted to pause for questions, if there are any. Chris Mele has the microphone. Please identify yourself. 
Maria Seidler. I'm with Dominion Resources, and I wanted first I'm to Maria. thank the senator for a reference to Virginia in your <laughs> opening remarks. We like the promotion. <laughs> uh, second, I would like to suggest that you add a fifth recommendation under energy efficiency, and that is the adoption of smart grid technology that does lead to real customer energy savings. And, and of course, all of the associated environmental benefits, carbon reduction, SO2 and all, from that. We have a lot of incentives for customer behavior, but utilities for taking smart, making smart decisions about how they operate their grid isn't being re very recognized. And I want to congratulate Naybrook and I'll point to as an example as to why it should be included for the resolution it passed back in 2012 in support of such smart grid technology, volt bar optimization, acknowledging it promotes grid modernization, it promotes energy savings, and it promotes environmental benefits. Uh, and, and, that, and then also then looking at other smart grid technology that contributes to the higher penetration of solar. Uh, you know, you can incentivize solar, but if the grid isn't prepared for it, it's really sad to be the third person on the block who's told, you can't have solar because it's going to create reliability issues. So we need to find a way to incentivize and reward our utilities for adopting uh, this kind of smart grid technology, sharing the incentives for solar. And I would, again, like I said, uh, encourage you to add that on a recommendation, and I would encourage everyone here to support NARUC and DOE by going to the uh, conference that they're looking at smart grid technology in the context of 111D because of its capability to contribute to our clean energy uh, initiatives. That's fabulous, Maria. Any thoughts about that? I think it's a great idea, and if we do a, a version 2.0, we'll, we'll definitely uh, do what you're, you're suggesting. I think it's a great suggestion. Could, could I, just on, on energy, electric efficiency, and I hate to be the contrarian, um, I, I totally recognize we can do a lot, lot better than we, we are. Um, EPRI did a major analysis earlier this year that suggests the potential for um, efficiency in the electric sector is huge. Yes. Um, and, and I commend that to your attention. I, but a single-minded focus on reducing electricity consumption may not necessarily always serve our interests. For example, think about carbon reduction. Um, we may want to deploy electricity to displace the burning of fossil fuels in the transportation and industrial sector. It may actually be better for the environment and for consumers to drive up electricity use to displace the use of fossil fuels. So I, I, we need to be careful. I, I think this needs to be done judiciously. Well, well taken, Richard. We need to do it thoughtfully, certainly. We have our final question from the Honorable Barry Smitherman. Thank you, Madam President. Barry Smitherman, Texas Railroad Commission. Dan, I have a child at Stanford, so I'm going to give you his name and ask you to kind of look out for him <laughs> for the next couple of years. Hours. <laughs> Texas, Oklahoma, other Midwestern states have more installed wind energy and are using more wind increasingly than other parts of the country. We have great wind resources, but we also have very progressive transmission policies. Uh, I noticed in your cookbook you don't address transmission. Perhaps that will come in cookbook two or three. But do you all have some observations about it? Because you can have the best solar and wind resources in the country, but if you can't get the product to market, it doesn't do any good. I just uh, I agree entirely, and, and of course Texas has uh, been the most innovative of the states I'm aware of in in finding a way to pay for the transmission to get the power from where it's produced, the renewable power, to the grid. Uh, you have these the uplift fee that is uh, uh, that I believe uh, essentially goes into a fund that that winds up paying for a lot of that transmission. The circumstance, reason we, one reason we didn't deal with it in this uh, cookbook was that uh, 
the circumstances from state to state are so different. In my state, the demand for the renewable power that we can generate from wind, and there's a lot we can generate from wind, the, re the demand is outside the state. It's difficult to, uh, to identify a scheme whereby New Mexico ratepayers would want to pay more to cover the cost of transmitting power outside the state. So we've got to find a better way to, to do this on an interstate basis so that if, if we're going to send power to Texas, Texas is going to find a way to pay for the transmission to get it there uh, because they're the ones benefiting from it. And the same thing if we're sending power to California. So anyway, we couldn't figure out exactly what to recommend that states have done that would be generally applicable. I, that's my, my perception, Dan. Yeah, and Barry, all I would add is that I also agree we need transmission. The, the challenge interstate has been citing, you know, a big interest in California in bringing in wind from Wyoming. How we get that very long transmission line cited uh, is, is, is quite challenging. So um, we're, we're all ears. We've got to crack this code along, as I said, with things like storage and, um, and other sources. But I think that uh, Cookbook 2.0, we're, we're ready, willing, and able. Well, thank you. I'll just say that uh, I obviously agree with Barry, and I think we have some examples of things we've done in the Midwest and in Texas that have started to crack that nut a little bit, but that's a topic of a whole other session and seminar. And it is. And I, we could talk about it for four hours, in fact. I have copies of the, if anyone wants a paper copy. Very good. I'm sure that there will be lots of interest in it. And quite frankly, Senator, you made Barry Smitherman's day when you said Texas is doing a great job at that. He loves that. Um, I, I really want to express appreciation to the Senator and to Dan and to Stanford and all of the team for an incredible, innovative work. And I think you've heard, as, as was mentioned about the states being the laboratory, you've really heard a great appreciation for your work and also great interest in the next one. Maria's point about innovation and how we link in technologies is superb and certainly transmission. So Senator and Dan, we'll be looking forward to your next editions and we invite you here to preview them. So with that, help me thank our panelists.